Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where OP gets $75,000 revenge. I work for a large shipping company in Canada. I work early in the morning loading trucks, but as needed, would go out and deliver packages. At first it was here and there, but it soon became normal that after my regularly scheduled shift, I would go out and deliver. This wasn't a requirement of my job. I was basically doing it as a favor because it looks really bad on the managers to have packages go undelivered, and I thought it would look good on me. I did this for a few years without any issue. One winter, one of the drivers at a different depot slipped and hurt himself while out delivering. This caused a new initiative to force all drivers to wear super slip-proof boots that have glass embedded in them. These run about 250 bucks. All the drivers received vouchers that would cover the cost because the requirements of doing the job. When I went to the manager to ask if I would be getting a voucher, he replied with, no, sorry, you're not a courier, and walked away. I went and told the other employees that were in a similar situation to mine, and they were pretty displeased. The next day, as usual after my shift, the manager started telling me the things I would be delivering that day. I waited for him to finish and responded with, sorry, I'm not a courier. He looked very confused, like he didn't remember our conversation from the day before. So I explained that I wasn't going to go out delivering because I wouldn't have the proper safety equipment. He had that, I just smelt a fart face and just looked at me for a second. He said, if you just work a few extra shifts, then you can afford to buy the boot yourself. I was actually stunned and I didn't know what to say, so we just stared at each other for a minute. I eventually replied, sort of laughing because of how ridiculous this is. So you want me to work without the safety equipment you made mandatory until I can afford to buy it for myself? He scoffed at me like a 14 year old girl and walked away without an answer. A few others followed suit and when the managers asked them to go out delivering after their shift, they replied with, sorry, I'm not a courier. After all was said and done, they had so many leftover packages, a few companies started dropping contracts, which directly affects the manager's end of year bonuses. They ended up having to give promotions to a lot of workers that were doing double work for half the pay to cover all the backlog. So we all ended up getting paid more to do less, and best of all, we finally got our safety boots, lol. Our next Reddit post is from Wheaton Walker. Many years ago, I worked as a maintenance technician on an automated assembly line. It was my job to perform quality edits throughout the section of the line where I worked. If something didn't pass inspection, then I would put the product on hold and test additional samples. Whenever this further test failed, I would stop production, notify the lead or supervisor, and then troubleshoot and repair the machine in question. For a few years, I worked the night shift. The night shift supervisor, who I'll call TD Gray, had a habit of vanishing for most of the night. He would be around at the start of the shift. We worked 12 hour shifts and then he would show up after the morning meeting and maybe dawdle about the office until the end of the shift. As I was doing my audits one night, I found a machine that was drifting out of specifications. I shut it down and paged Mr. Gray, but he didn't respond. I found the issue causing the quality failure and got the parts required for the repair. The repair took about an hour, followed by testing of 100% of the product for a few minutes. Meanwhile, TD Gray returned from the morning meeting. He was angry and walked straight up to me and asked who authorized me to shut down his machine. I tried to explain that it had failed an audit and that I was just following procedure. TD wasn't interested in anything I had to say. Apparently, during the morning meeting, he reported that our area was running with no issues. An engineer who would walk our area each morning contradicted him and said that the technician had one of the machines down for an hour and was just now releasing it to production. TD gave me a written warning and told me that I do not have the authority to stop production without his approval. A month or so later, a similar situation arose and I tried paging Mr. Gray who didn't respond. I should mention that this was well before cell phones, and no, we didn't carry pagers. To page someone, you had to call the reception desk and they would page them over the PA system. Since there wasn't a receptionist at night, this function was handled by a security guard. I told security to page Mr. Gray every 5 minutes until he responded. They wanted to do it every 30 minutes, but I insisted on nothing less than every 10 minutes and I also wanted them to log each page. This was normal procedure, but they often would just record one entry in the log regardless of how many times they repeat the page. When the engineer came in, he looked at my audit sheet and asked me why I hadn't stopped production. 
I explained that I had been told I couldn't without Mr. Gray's approval. I also told him that security had been paging him every 10 minutes since I found the issue. The engineer stopped production and told me to begin repairs. He then got a copy of the log from security and went to the morning meeting. When T.D. Gray reported that all machines were running with no issues, the engineer spoke up and asked why security had been paging him every 10 minutes for over three hours. I never did find out where Mr. Gray went every night or what he did, but he soon had more time to do whatever it was. Looks like there will be no pay for Mr. Gray. Our next Reddit post is from Hope We Sink. The house I grew up in was built on the side of a hill. Great views, but the geography posed some challenges for the city utilities, sewage in particular. Their solution was to put all the houses on the hill in what was called a shared line. Essentially, one big pipe ran through all of our backyards, just below the house's basements. Effluent would flow out from the houses, into the shared pipes, and then down the hill to the city sewer line by the bottommost house. When we moved in, we were at the highest point that it was possible to build on and still be part of that shared sewer line. But a few years later, someone bought a lot just over the crest of the hill and linked up with ours. Without being part of the planned community that had an HOA that took care of the sewer line, among other things. And, in fact, they did so without the HOA's approval. And so, for the next two decades, my family would be the subject of near constant harassment over the state of the sewer. Their end of the line was lower than ours by just enough that it would stop flowing and clog, often backing up into their basement bathroom and shower. They'd accuse us of diverting our refuse to their line because I guess we were some kind of plumbing wizards. Now, the reason nobody built a house on that part of the hill during the original development was that the soil wasn't stable. Something hydrology related. Sure enough, over the years, the house would occasionally separate from the hill and slide down a couple of inches. But our neighbors had connections in the code enforcement agency, so the place never got condemned like it should be. They just had to shore it up and reconnect all the utilities. The thing is, the further down the house moved, the steeper the negative incline was from their sewer connection to our junction box, making the clogs and backups even worse. At one point, it got so bad that their sewer barely flowed. Some days, it got completely clogged. Somehow, this was our fault. They spent the next year calling us every time they tried to flush a toilet and poo came out of their downstairs shower. They called a plumber, who said they had to redo their part of the shared line, and to do it, they'd have to bust through our two-story masonry wall so they could get a backhoe onto our property and dig out the line. Of course, we had issues with this. We said, no, you will not come onto our property and tear it up with a huge piece of construction equipment. Hire human laborers or something. But instead, they hired lawyers who started slinging paper around. According to them, we were in violation of state law that specifically gave an implied easement granting a homeowner access through another's property to maintain their own. So we hired lawyers of our own who said that we basically had a choice. We could win the case, but pay a ton of money or just let it happen. Either way, we'd be screwed. But they pointed out one important fact. That 20-year-old masonry wall wasn't in the greatest of shape anyway, so... A few months later, we presented them with a bill for $75,000 for the rebuilding of the wall, installation of a new set of stairs, replacement of the entire wrought iron fence that had separated the two properties, resodding, replacement of ornamental plants and shrubs, and some minor repairs to our sewer, which they had borked up while relaying their pipes. I'm not a general contractor, but my guess is that they could have hired pick and shovel labor to dig out that pipe and replace it with a new one for a fraction of that price. But no, they had to have a giant caterpillar tread machine do it. They balked. But then we handed them a Xerox copy of the letter the lawyer had sent us with pursuant to paragraph blah blah of the common code of blah blah blah. Citing the next paragraph, which stated that the person using the easement was 100% responsible for any damage that might be caused. They still balked, but my parents put a lien on their property that stayed there to the day they tried to sell, at which point they had to pay up or the purchaser's creditors wouldn't underwrite a mortgage. I think they had to pay interest too, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Then Sumo Ninja 17 has a contribution down in the comments. I raise and train dogs. I had a kennel with a concrete floor in an old house. 
neighbor comes over and tells me the kennel smells and is causing them grief when they use their pool. I took care to clean it every day, but I hired a company to come in and clean it twice a week, including scrubbing the floor with bleach. On a hot summer day he comes back, polite but obviously aggravated by the smell. I walked him back to the kennel and we stood right at the edge of the run. There were several piles of puppy exhaust, but no odor. I looked at my neighbor and asked him, how can my kennel be ruining your yard with odors if we can't smell anything standing right next to it? He looked totally confused. Truth be told, I was confused too. I asked him to take me into his yard so I could see or smell what he was talking about. We went into his yard closest to my kennel and the odor could have knocked a buzzard off a gut wagon. The stench was truly overwhelming. We gagged and made our way back to my yard. I told him that I now understood why he was so angry. I also told him what he smelled was not dog waste. He was smelling sewage. There's a difference between dog and human waste. He was more confused than ever. Short version, we found out that the farm behind us had multiple cesspools that were overflowing. They flowed downhill towards our yards. To my luck, the concrete floor of my kennel blocked the flow from getting into my yard, and since his yard was a low point, it all flowed into his yard. I joined forces with him to help fix the issue. The farm owners refused to do anything about the problem, until my brother-in-law, who worked for the water department in the water treatment plant of a neighboring big city, came to visit and looked at the issue. He said the issue was a major health issue and gave me the wording needed to make the owners fix the problem. Our health department came out the next day and deemed the farm uninhabitable. Basically, one small step from condemning it. The problem was fixed in a week. The farm owners dug up and filled in their three cesspools and connected their property to the local sewer lines, which were not available when the farm was built. It cost the farm owners well over $100,000 to fix the problem. And my next door neighbor and I were good neighbors until I moved. So was anyone else expecting the neighbor to not listen to reason and continue to complain about OP? Maybe reading all these stories is giving me a cynical view of humanity. Our next Reddit post is from VW Beds. I had to make a business trip to another city, Brighton from my home Bristol. There aren't really any decent train connections without going via outer London and you're talking about 4 or 5 hours train travel each way. So instead I decided to drive, under 3 hours, and to avoid being away from the family I got up early and left home at 5am. So I arrive at Brighton and need to wait on some colleagues. I know my employer will meet my cost for breakfast up to 8 pounds so I went to Subway and had a breakfast sub for under 3 pounds. I waited for the others and 30 minutes later they arrived so I offered to buy a coffee and one for myself so we can talk and plan before meeting our supplier at their offices. Fast forward and the day goes fine. I travel home same day and come to submit my expenses for £3 breakfast and £2 for two coffees, still under the £8 allowance. The finance team rejected my expenses for the coffee as, you've already claimed for breakfast. I pointed out it was the same cafe within 30 minutes and that if I'd bought the coffee at the same time as a sandwich, they'd approve it. What's more, as I traveled on the day of the meeting from home, I wasn't entitled to claim for lunch. I was told it was tough and I should stick to the expenses policy in the future. Okay. I've recently returned from visiting the same supplier as before. However, this time, I left work at lunchtime the day before to avoid traveling on my own time and ensure I arrived at a hotel during my normal working day. I then had an evening meal with drinks, a nice room in a city center hotel, a full buffet breakfast, and my parking and travel costs all covered. Since I'd traveled the day before, I'm entitled to claim lunch as I couldn't have taken a packed lunch from home and lastly, since I arrived home after 8pm, I claimed not only for another evening meal on the way home but a half day of time off in lieu of the time spent traveling home. At least I stuck to the expenses policy this time. Too long, didn't read, kept my expenses under £5 and got them refused due to not following policy. Followed the policy and company paid about £400 of expenses. Violent Goth down in the comments says it best. A true example of saving a penny, spending a pound. Our next Reddit post is from Rachel She. Background story. I was hospitalized one night for a spine problem and waiting for surgery the next morning. I was in a big double bed room with another patient with a couple of curtains separating the two beds. The other patient was a stroke patient with no speaking ability or mobility and she had a caretaker, not the patient's family. I was in agony so the doctor gave me something strong to fall asleep and it worked till 5am. 
My caretaker neighbor, for whatever reason, started playing very loud music from her phone. I was jerking awake and pissed. It's 5 in the effing morning. Are you kidding me? Let me sleep. So I asked her politely to turn off the music or use a headphone. Surprisingly, she just ignored me, not even bothering to say a word. The music was so loud that the nurse came in and asked her to turn it down because patients from the next room were complaining. The caretaker told the nurse her employer wasn't complaining, so she's fine with the music. If there's a problem, they should talk to her employer, not her. Her employer wasn't able to speak and move. This is basically torture. Here's the malicious compliance part. I noticed my neighbor patient always went to physical therapy at 9am and her horrible caretaker would stay in the room and sleep till 11.30am. Also, I made sure there's no other patients in their next rooms and told the nurse what my plan is. Then, I had my laptop and Bluetooth speaker with me and started to play the whole 2016 Tomorrowland playlist and turned the room into a nightclub. The caretaker was so pissed and screamed at me saying she was sleeping and my music woke her up. Well, tell your employer to file a complaint against me to the hospital or let your employer talk to me directly. Since then, my journey in the hospital has been a hundred times easier. Our next Reddit post is from the Salty Potato. This isn't me, but my parents. They absolutely love to tell this story. Before I was born, and if I'm correct, while they were still in their dating phase, they lived in Alaska. Both of them worked very hard, and it was a bit of traveling considering Alaska has certain parts where cities are few and far between. My mother had been sleeping when my father had just gotten home from work super early in the morning. Both of them were exhausted. My father had been quite hungry since lunch wasn't really as filling as he needed. He's a 6 foot 6, about 330 pound man, so it takes a lot. <laughs> He made the mistake of waking up my mother, who is the queen of malicious compliance, to go make him something to eat. She grumbled but got up, walked to the kitchen, and came back and handed him a bowl of Cheerios. My father can be picky sometimes. He looked at her, looked at the Cheerios, and said, Well, I was kinda hoping for something warm. My mother, wanting to be so nice for her tired, hard-working boyfriend, just took the bowl and sighed. All she muttered was, Okay, I'll see what I can do, and went off to the kitchen. A few minutes later, she comes back with the same bowl and hands it to my father, who notices it is indeed warm. He was very pleased only until he realized she had microwaved the Cheerios and already gone back to sleep. Needless to say, he didn't ask her to cook at 2am again. And then OP adds that his parents have been happily married for 20 years. Probably because the husband learned that critical lesson very early in the relationship. That was r slash malicious compliance and if you like this content then don't forget to subscribe because I put out new videos every single day.